you know, a lot of people who are doing master's degrees or have master's degrees and are doing PhDs uh, literally use this cheap labor within the system. And this is not a system that's owned to South Africa. This is something that happens globally. Um, and, and academia needs to have a long, hard look at itself for that because they, they, they use undergraduates, people who are still studying, they use them as, uh, to do their teaching, they use them to do their research, they use them to do other, perform other drudge, uh, grunge labor like uh, marking um, and so on. And for this reason, if you are not recognized inside academia or if you do not have a PhD in academia, you don't really have a foot to stand on to make comment on those things because after all, you are in the system wanting to get a PhD. So you are dependent on these senior people who have PhDs to, to write you letters of recommendation, to give you ins, to give you the, the access to resources. So you, you were trying to access resources, but at the same time, there's, there are these gatekeepers. And, and as academics, we have to admit that we have a lot of power over the position of students. Good afternoon, Jacob. Nice to see you again and good to have this conversation. I don't know where to start my academic journey. It's, it's, it's a journey that really starts in my childhood. My, my father was an academic. He worked at uh, UWC. He was first employed in 1969. He was per appointed permanent lecturer in 1971. And he worked here until 1999. Then he moved to Univers uh, University of Johannesburg. So in some sense, I could make the argument that you know, my academic journey starts um, with, my, with my parents, my father. My mother also eventually worked here on campus. She taught uh, social work all the years. So I come from, if you want to call it an academic family, but not your normal uh, or your you know, usual academic family. I mean, my family, um, my dad and my mother had, had a different approach to academia. They were, they were teachers in a real sense. My father had a passion for teaching. His passion wasn't research and publication. He didn't publish much during his life. But um, he certainly committed his years to the, to the academy and so on. So, as, as, a, as a student at, high, at primary school, high school, I suppose the path is already set for me. When I, when I matriculated, it wasn't a question. Am I going to go to university? Am I going to go do this? Am I? The question was, you're going to university. Uh, or the issue, the, the point was. Um, it was also not a choice for me, and this is on a personal level. It was never a choice of which university I go to. It was always going to be UWC. Um, I entered university at a time when it was just on that transition moment from, you know, in 1992, where we had the, the moves of 1991, the political moves, um, and we then started moving into that transition era before 1994. So I was a student in those years, and, you know, it was a very exciting time to be in the academy, and the thoughts and the kind of intellectual projects that were now were those about transition from old to new and so on. And I suppose that project gripped me and kept me at university. Uh, just like it wasn't ever a choice of whether or not to come to university, it was never a choice for me whether or not I was going to do a honors, a master's or a PhD. It was always going to be. This was, you know, my, my father just completed his PhD. Uh, my mother started the PhD, never completed it. But so my father had set that bar for us. So my journey is really kind of influenced by that. So I become, I, I entered the academy largely because of my father. Um, but once I was in the university space, the, the environment captures me because I have a love of reading. I have a love of thinking. I have a love of, um, of you know, looking at society and trying to analyze, trying to, 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 to see um, deeper than, than what's at the surface of society. Um, and that sort of drew and kept me into the, uh, drew me into and kept me in the academy all the years. Um, I think after my, my first and second year, there was no doubt for me as to what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an academic. 
Um, my path as an academic was, was very different from my father's. I, um, I went straight through from, from undergrad to PhD. I didn't take a break in between. Um, my, my father them had large gaps and they, they took years to do, you know, he came from a time, a era when doing a PhD wasn't a, a three, five year thing. It was something you did over time. It was a labor of love. Um, I come, I enter the, that PhD phase at a time when it's, you have to finish this within three years. Your funding is going to run out, you know, uh, and there's an urgency to do it. Almost a kind of a race to say, you know, so many people are completing their PhDs. You need to do yours in time to stay ahead of the race. Um, in retrospect, and, and I don't know if this fits into, it, it's part of the journey. It doesn't necessarily fit into the question as such. But in retrospect, I think it was a big, huge mistake on my part to go directly to PhD. I think I should have stayed or exited the academy or spent a little more time gaining experience in the academy just to reach a certain level of maturity before I start the PhD. I think that's something that's very vital. That the, it's not just a simple matter of having a PhD. I think I'm of the opinion that, that a PhD is, is a document that is supposed to show some kind of intellectual maturity on the part of, of, a, of a student. You're supposed to have reached a point where you think in a certain way or you, you consider problems and, and your social problems and, and issues out in society with a certain level of maturity. Maturity that comes with experience, but also that comes with, with having read more, having dug into something, having committed your time day and night to a particular question. So in retrospect, I would, I would take time between my master's and my PhD. Um, there's also other things. I mean, I struggled, I struggled with mental health issues during, when I completed my master's um, or just before completing my master's. So it was a real struggle to, to, to go into those final stretches of my master's. And I think I should have taken a break because in the third, say three and a half years into my PhD, I was completely burnt out. And for at least seven years, I didn't touch it again. So I, I, I started my PhD, spent three and a half years working frantically at it and then um, I, I, I had to, I was forced to take a break because again, I was literally burnt out. It, and I suppose that speaks to the question of around maturity because it's not just, you know, have I read enough? Because for sure, I'd read enough. I, I was, and I was constantly reading, I was hungry and, uh, for, for information on my topic. But if I'd had kind of emotional, spiritual maturity, I would have handled it differently. Um, I think there's also a kind of a discipline that comes with the maturity when you, when you uh, mature as a student. There's a certain kind of discipline that you learn that you don't have as a young student. So, you know, coming straight from first year into PhD, I didn't have that emotional, spiritual uh, uh, maturity, nor the discipline that came with that maturity in order to, to, to tackle the PhD and tackle it in a way that allows me to walk away from it unscathed. As, as it stands, and I, I, you know, I have to admit to this, as it stands, um, the initial encounters with my PhD was traumatic. PhD was, it, it's, it's a kind of trauma for some people. And for me, it was traumatic because I was, I, 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 I was at a point in the journey where I was confronted with my own limitations. I had to admit to those limitations. I had to admit that maybe I'm not ready. Maybe I shouldn't have jumped into the journey. And that in itself can be debilitating. And it, and it was for many years. Um, it's when I was in my 30s that I could return to it and say, okay, now I'm ready. Now I can, I can sit with this thing. I can, I can work through it. I can go through it sentence for sentence, word for word, and, and treat it differently from what, what it was or the way I treated it when I was younger. Um, yeah, and then I suppose when I completed my PhD, that's really when my academic journey started, even though I'd been in the academy uh, prior to that. But the real journey for me starts there because once you have the PhD, now you, in, in the, you actually enter the playing field. Before that, you're still standing on the margins. You're still on the sidelines. Once you have the PhD, you enter this environment where you can now 
uh, do things like apply for promotion. You can, you can, uh, you know, you, you have a voice in terms of being a researcher. You can speak about a particular topic. You can go and do this, that, seminars, conferences, and have your name recognized because now you're Dr. Ellis. So, I suppose, the, you know, in a, in a kind of a global sense, the, the answer to that question would depend on where you are in the world. In the United States, if you get appointed as a, a, you know, a full-time tenure-track person at a university, you're automatically professor. In the South African system, it works differently. Um, you can obtain a PhD, sit outside the academy, be Dr. Abrams, Dr. Josephs, or whatever it may be, um, or you can sit with your PhD inside the academy. If you're inside the academy, then you have the opportunities of going up the ranks, becoming lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor, full professor, senior professor. Um, so in South Africa, the title professor is actually, a, 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 I can't get to the English word now, a, a post flux. Uh, a job level, yes. Yeah. A, p a professorship is a, is a job post. level, a post level, yeah. Um, so it's something you, you, you apply for in terms of promotion and things like that. But of course, having said that, it's not just a question of stepping up a notch, earning a bigger salary and so on. When you become professor, there are different expectations of you in terms of how you act within the academy. You're expected to be able to do uh, one of a number of things. You, you of course, continue in your teaching. You're expected to perform in terms of research outputs at a certain level. You also have, uh, expect, uh, are expected to, to offer kind of institutional leadership, right? So your, your international footprint, your national footprint, your footprint within your, uh, within your discipline, you need to be able to make your mark there. You need to be able to be seen as someone who can operate at that level as well. Whereas if you're seeing a lecture, you're not really expected to do that. Um, the professor also is someone who, how would I put this, who's also possibly drawn into a kind of community of action. You have, uh, I mean, they call it community engagement. How I see it is that, you know, at some point, some outside organization, some community-based organization or organization that, you know, government or wherever it may be, will come and say, we need your expertise as a person who has qualifications in anthropology. So you're being asked to in, get involved in quote unquote community uh, efforts or work um, because of who you are in, 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 your, uh, in your standing as, as a professor or discipline or an academic. Um, when, I mean, when they say community engagement, it's not like I volunteer at a drug uh, rehab or I volunteer at the soup kitchen. That's not really what they mean. What they mean is um, your expertise is actively sought out as someone who can make a contribution to what's happening out there outside of the academy. Um, it's also not uh, just a reference to say activism work. Um, it might include activism work, but it has to be clear that, you know, when you're called upon to do work in activism, um, it's because you are an expert in a particular field. You may be a person specializing in the study of violence or community development, or, you know, maybe something like, uh, like uh, land reform or something like that. And people then call on your expertise for that. So those are the kinds of things that are expected, you as, uh, expected of you as a professor. I mean, another thing one could add is that, you know, um, a lot of the research work that gets done at universities requires funding. So as a professor, you're also expected to be able to, to write funding proposals, pull projects together, manage those projects and produce possibly students out of those projects, PhDs, MAs, uh, the like, and, and you know, have real uh, kind of, uh, what do they call them, um, or have publications, reports, and things like that, that that speak to the research topic of your project. So you're also expected to be able to, to do that. You know, you're not supposed to just slot into somebody else's project. You're supposed to be able to, as you, uh, you know, generate your own projects. And that includes funding, design, research, implementation, supervision of students, and so on. So, you know, in order to be a professor, however, you have to be a doctor. And um, you, you asked earlier, you know, off camera um, about 
can you be a professor without a PhD? Well, the thing is, um, that really depends on your university. The university can, under special circumstances, has in the past, um, promoted people to the level of professor without them having um, a doctorate. It has happened in the past. I think in the meantime, policies, would have, policies might have changed. But I think until 10, 15 years, 10 years ago, there were some people at UWC who were professors, but I remember the one case, and I'm not going to mention the name, the person had an honors degree. But because of their performance in the field, because of the leadership that they showed, um, the university at some point thought it proper to promote them to the rank of professor. There was also a time under apartheid many years ago, 70s and 1980s, where people were promoted to professor uh, as a part of kind of a privilege, uh, the dishing out of privileges um, or enrolling people in a particular agenda uh, for the university. So people were promoted because they thought these people will be prime representatives of this or that kind of strategy or that kind of, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, campaign or something like that. So under, and then this, this includes people of color and people, of, uh, you know, uh, white people and so on. Um, so yeah, the, there has been in the past, but I think now the, the sense is, because there are so many PhDs out there, because there are so many people who, who are working actively in the, in, in the academy, who, who are operating at that level, that it, it's, it's unlikely that you will be promoted to professor without your PhD. Um, but we're operating in the academy, and you know, academia has its autonomy in terms of things like this. I mean, by all means, if, if, if someone like a Nelson Mandela comes along, why not let them be Professor Nelson Mandela? <clears throat> but there are other instruments um, which don't sit within the normal kind, let me not say normal, but let me say the usual uh, structure of the university. So generally, professor means you're an academic, you're employed as a lecturer, you, you, you work in research, and you slot into the, the ranks of the university system. There are tools um, in the university to appoint people to say, Professor Extraordinaire. I, I forget the exact titles, um, or Professor Emeritus or something like that. And these are people who've either exited or sit outside of the academy, but because of, but because of their achievements, it, it, is, it is thought that they can retain the rank of professor, um, or they can, even though they don't have the commensurate qualifications, they can actually be operating or considered a professor. Um, Einke Kroch is, is a case in point. Um, there was another guy, Dennis Brutus, I think, was also somebody who was appointed at that level at one point yeah, at UWC. They'd given recognition for lifetime achievements and thought that, you know, if we employ this person, we cannot employ them as an ordinary lecturer. This person has achieved very well in the literary world. We need to bestow on him the, the title professor. Um, there's something else one needs to say about professorship in South Africa, and, and this speaks to issues that, that, um, that are out there in the community. Once I leave the university, unless it has been determined by, uh, by the uh, decision of Senate, I am not allowed to call myself professor anymore. I am only professor as long as I'm inside the university system. So when I exit, I, I leave my title behind. I can be doctor but I can no longer be professor. Unless I get an emeritus position, which means that for the, for the duration of my, uh, um, of my appointed as, appointment as emeritus, I can, re I can still call myself professor. So it, it's always wonderful to me to see people who exit the academy refer to themselves as professor so-and-so. Well, the offhand um, response is, yes, it's better with a PhD. Um, you're better able to access the privileges, the, 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 um, the resources within the university. Uh, you may find that if you are in the university system and on an, uh, you know, involved in academic activities such as teaching, research and so on, if you only have a master's degree, you may not be recognized as a permanent person or you may just, I mean, I. I have a big issue with this, but you know, a lot of people who are doing master's degrees or have master's degrees and are doing PhDs are literally used as cheap labor within the system. 
And this is not a system that's owned to South Africa. This is something that happens globally. Um, and, and academia needs to have a long, hard look at itself for that because they, they, they use undergraduates, people who are still studying, they use them as, uh, to do their teaching, they use them to do their research, they use them to do other, perform other drudge, uh, uh, grunge labor like uh, marking um, and so on. And for this reason, if you are not recognized inside academia or if you do not have a PhD in academia, you don't really have a foot to stand on to make comment on those things because after all, you are in the system wanting to get a PhD. So you are dependent on these senior people who have PhDs to, to write you letters of recommendation, to give you ins, to give you the, the access to resources. So you, you were trying to access resources, but at the same time, there's, there are these gatekeepers. And, and as academics, we have to admit that we have a lot of power over the position of students. And, and um, I'm not saying anybody, abu I, I can't accuse anyone specific of abusing that, but you do hear the stories. You do get general comments being made that, you know, that people say, as somebody with just a master's degree, I'm doing all this work. I'm even helping my fellow students on behalf of my lecturer. I'm helping other master's students. I'm reading their work. I'm making comment. But you are given none of the rewards of that position. So literally to get your foot in the door and keep your foot in the door, you have to have a PhD. I want to also answer the question in, in a slightly different way. And that is with reference to, let's call it minimum qualifications. So what do people generally think if they are doing a master's or if they're pursuing a PhD? They, they're very limited in their thinking. They tend to limit that thinking to, to the fact that I will be an academic. I will enter academia and that's why I'm doing an MA, that's why I'm doing a PhD. But I think we need to, to work with that logic in a different way. We need to say, for instance, why not give people the, or not, let me not say, let me, let me rephrase that. We need to remove the impression that doing a master's or doing a PhD means that you are going to enter the academy. Why not have a government official or have a minimum qualification for somebody working in a certain department in government, say Department of Constitutional Development? Why not say the minimum qualification for working here is a master's? If you're going to be dealing with policy issues around community development or constitutional development, you know, you need to at least have something, a, qualifi a minimum qualification, master's in law. Um, or if you're going to be entering Department of, uh, of Social Development, an MA in social work or something like that, why not demand that your directors have PhDs? Because after all, you know, 30, 40 years ago, PhDs were a rarity. Now, I'm not going to say the run of the month, but now more and more people have the time, the resources, the inclination to do PhDs. So we have more and more people qualified at that level. Why not use those resources outside the academy? So my thing is that students must start to rethink the ends or the kind of, the, the, you know, where they're going to end up. And one of the things they need to do is think that, you know, I can take my PhD out there into the world and make it work there. I don't, uh, the PhD is not only good for the academy. Or maybe we do need to say that. Maybe we just say, well, you know, the PhD is only actually, otherwise we have to admit to that, you know, maybe the PhD is actually only good if you're going to enter the academy. And then if you're not thinking about going into the academy, then don't do a PhD. But we can't say that to people, you know, because not everybody's doing it to enter the academy, of course. Some people, you know, you may have the rare person who's doing it for personal fulfillment. And, and that, and that in itself is, is acceptable and, 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 you know, is a position that was, is in some ways as respectable as somebody who's saying, I'm, I'm, re I'm doing a PhD and I'm going to be an academic. You know, the person says, this is my life vision. And regardless of where I work, I want to have a PhD. My, 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 my view on it is very pessimistic. 
um, so what does it take to enter the academy? And let me just look at my journey. I started here as a student in 1992. I completed my undergrad in 1994. I started my honors in 95. I completed it at the end of 90, let me see, 92, 93, 94. Yeah, I completed it towards the end of 95. I started my MA. Um, and by the time I was honest, it was a third year student, I was already tutoring. So I was technically already in the university system. If I have to mark the moment from, uh, from when I started as a tutor to the moment that I became a permanent lecturer, we're looking at the span of two decades. Right? Not exactly, but more or less 20 years. So I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity, to have the background, um, the resources at my disposal to allow me to stay in the system that long so that I eventually get a job. And this is, again, my situation is not unique. This is not just me. This is the journey for a lot of people in the academy. You can ask academics how long they were on contract, how long they did contract teaching, and because they were on contract, depended on new contracts. Every year. They did all the donkey work for the department. They did all the grudge work. They did everything everybody else didn't want to do because you wanted that contract for the next year and you were hoping for that permanent appointment. And this may not be the pathway for everybody. Other people may enter the, the academy easily, quickly. But for this, you know, I, I want students who aspire to be academics to know that there are very few academic jobs. Once we are in these jobs, we sit still in them for 30 years. And it's not like, you know, somebody's retiring every year, so there's always something opening up. No. A job may open up once every five years, once every six years. Contract jobs are always there. The peace jobs, the part-time work is always there. But the actual permanent position with all the benefits, with all the, you know, the, the status and other associated things, that comes around infrequently. So if you're thinking about entering the academy, Ask yourself, how long can I wait? And, you know, we can just count it. And, and just think in terms of, of plain years. If you, if you start first year and you go straight to PhD and complete your PhD, you're looking at three years for undergrad, one year for honors, three years for masters, three years minimum for PhD, maybe five. You're already looking at 12 years a decade just on that simple path from first year to PhD and with PhD hopefully some academic appointment. How many of our students, um, rural poor, urban poor, doesn't matter, um, less well resourced household, how many of those students can afford to wait 12 years before, they, before there's even the promise of a permanent position. And that's been my path through to, into, into the academy. I was, a for, uh, 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 I was fortunate enough to have all, always been offered contract positions, to have earned you know, fairly well in contract positions. Um, and I could afford to wait it out in those contract positions. But not everybody can afford, and not everybody has access. Because even these contract positions, they're in short shrift. There's not many of them. And they, you know, people, again, people who get into these contract positions tend to stay there. Right? And, and you know, we fossilize in the contract positions the same way we fossilize in the, in the permanent appointments. So, yeah, I would say, you know, If you have aspirations of, of becoming an academic, that's what faces you in terms of pure job prospects. But we mustn't throw away the other aspect that's, very, that's vital here. And that's leading a healthy, vibrant, um, active intellectual life. Being an intellectual and being intellectually curious 
um, is not something that you need to do within the university. You may even find that the university, to some extent, may be intellectually stifling. So somebody who's doing a PhD is a purely intellectual pursuit. They may find it as rewarding outside of the academy as they do inside. So we need to also, you know, I think we, we've, we're too caught up in this kind of um, workplace, career orientated uh, approach to postgrad studies. I think sometimes it's just your personal fulfillment and your curiosity and your own personal, spiritual, intellectual development. And that part of your, of your life is as important as what you earn or what job it is you do. Right? You may find your job uh, spiritually, intellectually numbing, but then you still have your intellectual pursuit. I met somebody two weeks ago who was a change manager. And when I chatted to her, what did you study? No, she has an MA in microbiology. She's not working as a microbiologist, but it doesn't mean that she's left her interest because she could still animate it and talk about her research, about the things that interest her in biology, microbiology for that matter. Right? And, in, and she has other intellectual pursuits. They, she reads. Right? She debates with friends. She, she associates with people who carry that kind of conversation. We're into the aesthetics, we're into this, you know. So yeah, I, I think there's a difference between just getting somebody qualified, getting somebody with the technical proficiency to do a job, versus somebody who is, is a much more well-rounded person, who has a well-rounded social academic life, intellectual academic life, and not just somebody who works in the academy. Um, and in some senses, I think for our, you know, especially in a country where we have, where we have unaddressed national trauma that, that goes back decades. You know, it's, you're not going to heal the trauma of apartheid in, in 20 years. And I'm not talking about, you know, the, uh, you know, job equality, income equality. I'm talking about personal trauma people for whom it is difficult or will become difficult because of what they've experienced under apartheid to, to lead good lives. So especially in, in the context where people are suffering those kind, or have suffered those kinds of trauma and we're stuck, you know, it's intergenerational. We've not only suffered, we transmit that trauma to, to younger people, to our children and so on. In that context, it's important that we we have students who are not there simply to pursue a career, which is a very kind of narrow, instrumental uh, approach to, 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 to this rich intellectual life that you have in the academy. And that if we find people who pursue these intellectual things or these, you know, who study these disciplines, in a truly intellectual pursuit and outside of what they may benefit from it when they've done the PhD, then I think we will produce, because then you can go anywhere. It doesn't matter what you, because what you, I was really passionate about this. Yes, I'm still passionate about a lot of things, but I don't do them at work. And they're not hobbies or things like that. They're, they're real intellectual passions, you know, that I read up on that I, I look into, that I debate with people. And I think it's more, you know, the university sort of talked about graduate attributes and so on. I don't think these things can be written down in policy. But the creation of that really well-rounded person who can lead a full life intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, socially, culturally, that is, that is the real reason behind a, a PhD for me.